Okay, um, so the last thing we are going to look at uh, is what is called an intrusion detection system. So it's called IDS. Now, like a firewall, an IDS is also run on a dedicated computer. Uh, now, uh, it's typically run in promiscuous mode in the sense that nobody else in the network will be able to see uh, its presence. So, uh, again, an intuition detection system is run within inside a network. So, it's more like uh, what is a burglar alarm to our home. So, uh, if someone tries to penetrate inside your house, the alarm goes on. So, uh, uh, the IDS is something like that. So, if a packet uh, manages to penetrate inside your network by either bypassing the firewall or like as I said, an internal uh, threat is there which the firewall could not find out then uh, that's when IDS can come into picture and be able to give some protection to the network. Now, uh, uh, so the main purpose of an IDS is to, as I state here, to identify suspicious or malicious activity, uh, note activities that deviate from normal behavior, then do some uh, log bookkeeping in the sense that uh, the uh, uh, IDS can store uh, a log of all these activities that happen say during a certain period of time and let the admin to look at those log files and then classify whether uh, those are uh, been, uh, those are bad or good or bad basically and uh, based on this classification the IDA's rule set could be updated so we'll see the details as we proceed now, an uh, IDS typically is considered to be passive in the sense that it will primarily do detection. Uh, it will not kind of respond to the attack. It will detect the attack but not respond to the attack. Now, later I have a slide where I have something called uh, intrusion protection system or I think it's prevention system. I think that's better to call prevention. Yes. So, intrusion prevention system. Uh, that will kind of respond to the attack. Okay, so we'll see that uh, as we move along. Now, uh, so typically, if you look at uh, the kind of architecture for an IDS, it will have a signature database. Again, a set of rules that will help the IDS decide whether to classify the attack traffic, uh, 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 whether traffic as attack traffic or not. So it will get the network traffic and kind of gather all that uh, traffic and, and store it uh, in a database and then uh, also it will get some input from the critical files in the uh, IDS database and the log files that stores the previous activities and so on and does some analysis. So here is where you could run all these neural network techniques and uh, artificial intelligence techniques to do such analysis. And if it is, it is suspected to be malicious, then the user is kind of alerted that uh, this is some suspicious traffic. And it also uh, generate, will generate report to our, for the user to look at sometime later. So uh, now this could be also kind of controlled in the sense that the user could make the IDS to uh, uh, learn that uh, some traffic is not atta attack traffic, it is a kind of a genuine traffic that could be allowed inside. So it will then uh, learn this information and update its database. Or sometimes it will be updated to uh, get to know some traffic is attack traffic and should not be allowed anymore. So either way it will be able to get to know. So IDS database is kind of regularly updated. It's not like you configure it once and leave it as it is. Now still, uh, it, was, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, entirely possible that uh, an IDS could lead to some false positives and false negatives. Uh, you might have come across this term in a machine learning or uh, any uh, data science class. Uh, so a false positive in our uh, context is an IDS classifying an activity or traffic as malicious when it is actually not malicious. 
so when some activity is genuine or traffic is genuine uh, but the idea is, is kind of suspecting that it is a malicious thing and it is classifying as an attack traffic or activity so that's called false positive and false negative uh, in our context is that an IDS is classifying an activity which is actually malicious but it is classifying as not malicious okay so between the two false positives and false negatives uh, from the definition what I state here uh, you could feel that it is okay to have some false positives uh, rather than having some false negatives because a false negative will be more uh, uh, no damaging for the network compared to having some false positives. So false positives is okay. It could leave some. It could lead to some denial of service uh, or some attack uh, or, or some sessions to be closed. Uh, but as I said, the signature rule could be updated and the traffic could be allowed after some time. Whereas if you have some false negatives, that means you are letting an attack to happen rather than detecting such attacks so that should not be really allowed so uh, you should try to have very few false negatives compared to uh, uh, trying to reduce false positives now uh, we can see some categories of IDS based on two issues one is the signature uh, based on signatures and rule set that is maintained at the IDS now one category of IDS could be called signature based IDS, it's more like your antivirus scanner. If you know how the antivirus scanner will function, it will have all the virus code as signatures and if any code, uh, the antivirus scanner of any set of data information that it sees on a computer matches with the code for or the pre-built code in the signature database, it will alert the user that okay this is a looks like a virus code so it's entirely signature driven so if there's a new attack traffic uh, that comes to uh, the network uh, the pattern of the attack uh, you know similar uh, similarly uh, the signature based ideas could have some database that has a pattern of an attack like a session hijacking attack or a sin flood attack and all those things these are classical attacks for which there will be well defined pattern so those could be stored in the signature database but if some new attack comes for which the IDS is not configured with a pattern then it will allow that pack, uh, such traffic to enter the network and do the damage. So this means it could have some lead to some false negatives. Uh, uh, it is less likely to cause false positives because uh, false positive means it's a good traffic that you are blocking. Uh, no, because the signature will tell what is good and what is bad. So if it's really good, it will let it inside. So a signature based IDS is likely to have more false negatives compared to false positives, which is not a good thing. So that is why people prefer a second category called anomaly based IDS, uh, which will start with very minimal set of rules. And so anything that deviates from these rules could be classified as suspicious and kind of alerted and reported to the admin and the admin will look at those uh, the log files of those activities and then decide whether to classify them as good or bad and then update the rule or expand the rule set uh, so which means an anomaly based ideas basically uh, will uh, treat anything that deviates from the normal is bad suspicious uh, so that way you could even capture or uh, detect the new attacks that uh, for which uh, the IDS need not know a pattern because if the new attack uh, uh, appears to have a pattern that is not in its rule set then it will capture it will categorize that as a malicious activity so this way you are less likely to have false negatives and but more likely to have false positives because anything that deviates from normal is classified as attack traffic so you're likely to have some false positives but as i said it's okay to have false positives but it's not that good to have false negatives so between the two ideas uh, again there's a trade-off as you can see which what you what you want if you are okay with false positives uh, and you want to avoid false negatives you better go for anomaly based ideas if you want a rule based uh, and uh, you don't want users to get annoyed uh, if that if, if the good users to get annoyed uh, if the packets get dropped 
then you go for signature based ideas now based on where an ideas is placed and what kind of uh, coverage in the network they can provide we can have network based ideas and the host based ideas in a very pure sense an ideas typically by, by ideas we typically mean a network based ideas okay so host based ideas uh, it's like as i said a personal firewall uh, is really host specific so you could really detect those attacks that are targeted at a specific host or you could block some traffic that is not liked by the user of that specific host uh, but again, uh, you, uh, you would prefer to run an IDS on a dedicated computer, but a host based IDS cannot be run on a dedicated computer. It has to be run along with the other applications running on the computer. So it could be also easily compromised by, to an attacker. Okay. So uh, we really would uh, deal with network based IDS to really uh, protect the network from a lot of attack traffic. Uh, so the network based idea is runs in promiscuous mode and uh, like a firewall it's placed next to the firewall and so it will look at all the incoming and outgoing traffic and again uh, one network based ideas may not be sufficient to protect a very large network you may need to have few uh, network intuition detection system uh, but uh, Again, you don't need that many ideas like a host based ideas on every host. You just need a few that can cover the entire network. And they sometimes have to coordinate, uh, exchange the rules and exchange their, uh, what you call, whatever they have categorized so far in order to conclude whether an attack traffic, whether a traffic is an attack traffic or not. So they have to do some coordination. Now, as I said, an idea is, is typically uh, considered to be passive. So they do not respond to the attack. Uh, also, uh, they are not typically configured with uh, the uh, what you call the secret information that are used by the servers to establish communication sessions with uh, clients and uh, machines outside the network. So in that sense, they cannot handle what is called encrypted traffic. So they can look at what is what they can see which is typically the plain text data if they can figure out that it is malicious they will be able to classify it as malicious if it is encrypted traffic they cannot figure out what it is so and also that such traffic cannot be just dropped because there could be genuine information inside so they'll have to simply let those traffic to enter the network and get processed and also if as i said if there is an attack that originates from a host within a network like an employee la launching a virus code to damage all the machines within a network a network based ideas cannot be able to find it out okay so in order to kind of be more responsive and also be able to handle encrypted data uh, traffic you need what is called an intrusion prevention system uh, this is not a pure term, you, you could make an IDS to also behave like an IPS in the sense that uh, if you make it to be able to handle encrypted traffic and respond to an attack, it, it will function as an IPS. So this is not a separate uh, kind of application that you need to run. But just in ter classification terminology, when an IDS is responsive and can handle attack uh, encrypted traffic, then we call it as an intrusion prevention system. That is how you can look at this. So uh, IPS, as I said, uh, will not only stop from finding out, okay, this is an attack traffic. So let me just classify this as attack traffic. So that's what an IDS will do. It will just classify and report that attack to the uh, admin. Whereas an IPS will try to kind of respond to the attack. So for example, if you have a SIN fled attack, uh, where uh, the client machines are trying to open multiple uh, you know, TCP sessions with a particular server and flood the server with send request messages, then the IPS could send a TCP reset message, you all know by now what is a TCP reset message, to terminate a connection uh, uh, to all those machines and, they, and then close the session. Uh, so that way it could uh, prevent a potential attack from being generated in that network. Now, uh, uh, it could also 
be uh, you know uh, again as i said in the end of the firewall topic the firewall rules need to be constantly or regularly updated so the intrusion prevention system could constantly uh, co coordinate with the firewall so whatever uh, comes to an ips and, and gets classified as an attack traffic is something that the firewall has let in right so that means a firewall at that time does not know there's an attack traffic if it has if it knows it's an attack traffic it would have blocked it right there so that traffic comes in and ips is able to classify it as an attack traffic so the ips will then coordinate with the firewall and let it uh, update its the firewall rules that so and so traffic coming from a specific ip address or port number is an attack traffic and that needs to be blocked so in future the firewall will not allow that attack traffic from getting inside okay so that is how an ips could coordinate with the firewall now to handle encryption keys so the ips could be configured with the private keys that the servers uh, uh, in the internal network are using so that means any uh, ssh kind of secure shell uh, connections that the servers have with the outside machines uh, all the messages that are being sent between the servers and the outside machines can be now also processed by the ips and as i said if there is a malicious code that comes to the network and is about to reach the server for being processed and processed then the ips could first uh, block that packet and uh, process the code and if it looks like a malicious code that should not be processed by server it will block such packets so uh, this way an ips could uh, handle encrypted data by knowing the private keys of the servers uh, of course the ips should not get compromised to an attacker so if it gets compromised to an attacker then you lose all, all those private keys so that's why again you have to operate it on a very dedicated machine uh, so one last thing I want to add to this IDS topic is this honeypot. You might have come across this terminology. So uh, honeypot, as the name indicates, is, an, uh, is like in a common sense, uh, you keep a pot of honey and you try to get some bees to come. Uh, so uh, in, a, in a network intrusion direction point of view, the way it is done is you allocate some IP addresses to some machines now uh, those machines really do not have any value in the sense that uh, uh, there should not be any genuine communication coming to those machines because nobody in the outside network would know such ip addresses because you're not advertising that this ip address is hosting so and so information so you can send packets to this to this uh, ip address in order to get some information you would not advertise anything like that so that means you would not uh, uh, expect any genuine uh, machine to send packets to a honeypot okay but if you put it out there with an ip address if some packets come to that honeypot machine then it indicates that somebody is trying to uh, hack your network so in the beginning of this module i said uh, talked about re reconnaissance where you do some port scanning, net, net, uh, nmap and all these things. So to find out what are the IP addresses of the machines in your network, what are the port numbers, what are the operating systems of your servers running in your network and so on. So if uh, such packets will also reach a honeypot. So if uh, you are able to capture such packets running at, uh, coming to a honeypot, then you, uh, so it's more like a preventative measure. So. Uh, than being reactive. So the IDS is more reactive in nature, whereas uh, a honeypot is more preventive in nature. So you could, okay, get to know that, okay, somebody is trying to hack to our network. So let us be careful from now on. So that is the purpose of using a honeypot. Now, one specific thing uh, uh, we could also uh, make use of for a honeypot is to find out whether somebody is trying to uh, use your uh, honeypot as uh, spam uh open relay you know uh so there's something called a honey net we could have which is the network of honeypot and your honeypot within a honey net could serve as open relays uh to uh, for the spam senders you know the spam email senders 
uh, they do not want to send the spam emails out from their own IP address. So they'll try to find what is called an open relay uh, uh, in the internet, uh, which is like an email server that allows anyone in the internet to send emails through it. So whoever receive, is receiving the emails uh, will see the open relay's uh, IP address as the originating address of the email. So that way a spammer can hide behind the uh, open relays and do not get exposed. So uh, you could advertise that your honeypot could serve as open relays in your network and see uh, someone is whether someone is trying to send spam emails to that honeypot. And if any email comes, such email comes to a honeypot, you can find out from where it is coming and uh, you could really kind of uh, block uh, such a spam email from being spread out. So you could get all those spam emails uh, but do not send it out, do not really, uh, really uh, send all those spam emails to the genuine client. So the honeypot will simply drop all those spam emails coming from the uh, spam email sender. Okay. Uh, so this way you could uh, prevent some spam uh, emails from going out to the internet. Okay, so that's one use of honeypot. So uh, again, as I said, this is more like a preventative measure compared to an IDS, which will be you know uh, responding to an attack. So this is not responding to an attack. This is actually trying to find out that could be a potential attack. Right. So with that, we finish this module. Let me quickly save this and we'll come back.